Greetings. Thanks to everyone for coming out for our group author reading. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women's Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and non-binary authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women's Strange Worlds in the handout that we've provided in the chat and by visiting our website, which is also going to be added to the chat. It's strongwomenstrangeworlds.weebly.com. And I'd also like to take a moment to thank those of you who have made a tip jar donation. Thank you from the very bottom of our hearts. We appreciate you so much. I am your host today, Kate Pope, and you can find out more about me in that provided handout as well. Please note that the recording of this session by the audience is not allowed and recording of electronic communications, including Zoom meetings and webinars without permission is illegal. Tonight, we are going to be featuring six authors, W.A. Simpson, Nicole Wilson, Marie Bilodeau, sorry, Marie, I'm pretty sure I just mispronounced that, might be, Arlene F. Marks, Mariska Pichette, and Cynthia Gomez. Each author will have eight minutes to read. Our first reader is W.A. Simpson. W.A. Simpson has been writing since the age of five and finished her first novel at 14. Her debut novel, Tinderbox, is the 2022 gold winner for Fantasy Forward Review's Indie Award. She shares her home with her older brother and two diva cats. W.A., take it away. Hi, everybody. How are you? Thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm going to read a little bit of the first chapter of, as stated, my book, Tinderbox. Uh, it's a high fantasy with a strong female character. And first, um, as you can see in my series, Tales of the Riven Isles. Okay. <clears throat> the vermin of the earth had long claimed the corpse of the witch, but Isbet recognized the old woman right away, despite her head being severed from her body. Death had taken her, yet her voice and her blood cried out for justice from beyond the veils that separated the living from the deceased and other creatures that roamed the places in between. Isbet knelt in the rich loam and laid her staff, Gamir, beside her, not noticing that his face, carved face, was in the dirt. A fine way to treat me. Hush, Isbet's voice was harsher than she intended. She reached on her right and turned the staff over, although he could quite easily do so himself. Who did this to you? Isbet removed her backpack from around her shoulders and laid it aside. The lifeless pile of bones could not answer, at least not on their own. Isbet closed her eyes, willing something to come to her, an image, a face, anything. However, her power as a diviner was tenuous, and she often needed talismanic help. Isbet could feel her fingers curling into the dirt and the power burning in her veins. I will kill you. I will make you suffer for what you have done. It was not until the burning reached her eyes and she felt the stinging tears pooling within that she had breathed that she had breathed in, fighting for control. Now is not the time for this. She must find out. She must know. Isbet, Ramirez's voice brought her out of her turmoil. See where she is? The witch's body lay near the ancient hollow tree, a great-grandfather in the old forest that had survived the many wars and other follies of man. Isbet knew what was underneath its tangled roots. She had played here as a child, spending many a lazy summer afternoon at hide-and-seek in the catacombs, not with mortal children like her, but with the children of the earth. She wondered where they were now. Do you suppose it's Isbet's brow furrowed, and she tugged at one of the myriad of thin braids she wore. She wouldn't have gone into the cave. She couldn't. Isbet went to stand, her legs stiff from kneeling. The box, she thought. It must be. It would explain much, Gamir said. Isbet did not want to leave the remains there, but she had to see what was amiss. She approached the tree and investigated the gaping hole in the trunk large enough to allow a grown man to descend into the cave underneath. Even with the sun high as it was, shadows lay across the rough walls. Still, Isbet had a sense that something was not right. 
When she went to boost herself into the hole, Gamir said, Shouldn't we see to her first? His words caused her to pause. Gamir was right. It was difficult to tell how long the remains had lain there. If not, pro if not properly laid to rest, they would taint the place as her body decayed. So would her gift. It would continue to flow from her body, spreading like a plague to steal the life of the woods. Yes. When Isbet knelt again, she reached for her pack. Inside, she kept everything she needed to send the old woman to rest. Once she finished here, Isbet would see to other things. Isbet plunged Gamir into the soft earth. The red jewels that served as his eyes glittered. That face reminded her of the old spirits that lived in the trees, which made sense since the wood of the staff came from the celestial vine, which climbed into the heavens only to fall by the woodsman's axe. Isbet had visited the forest where the vine held sway. Its twisted limbs were the home of innumerable mythic beasts and beings. Isbet's eyes settled on the corpse again. It was a moment before she noticed the wetness on her face as the tears escaped. She swallowed the stone that had lodged in her throat. Old mother, forgive me for being away for so long. I was not here to save you. The urge returned to throw herself to the ground and weep, to scream curses, but Isbet forced the bitter loss down. There would be time for grieving later. First, she would find her grandmother's murderer. From the pack, she drew what appeared to be a cameo pin. Anyone not trained in the arcane would see the profile of a young, creamy-skinned maiden, but those with the gift saw the face of the dun she, her eyes black within their sockets, her mouth opened in a soundless scream. Isbet laid the cameo on what remained of the witch's breast, her movements practiced. She climbed to her feet, brushing the decaying leaves from her knees of the trousers she wore. Unlike other maidens, Isbet did not hinder herself in dresses and robes. There were too many evils in the realm to risk capture because one tripped on the folds of a skirt. Her gaze skimmed the surrounding area until she found what she searched for, resting at the base of the tree. It was a mighty blow, Gamir commented. Isbet didn't bother to respond. The witch's skull stared at her. Isbet lifted it and made her way back. She positioned the skull above Above the body, Isbet sat cross-legged. All was in readiness, but she didn't act. She stared at the eyeless sockets of the skull of the woman who had taught her the secrets of the realm. Isbet? Isbet drew in a labored breath. She had yet to perform the ritual, and already she felt the weight of exhaustion in her bones. Despite that, Isbet stretched her back, reached out one slim hand, and she let her palm down over the cameo. She spoke the name. The face on the cameo came to life, a scream burst from within its lips, and a wind not felt by Isbet whipped the lifeless gray strands of the Dunshee's hair into distress. The wailing of the death talisman did not disturb her, as its agonized cry filled the air around her. Nor did she find any concern at the unseen presence that approached her, the veil between the mortal and the other. Isbet reached out again. Another gift of, her, of the students of the arcane was the ability to move the veils aside to allow a spirit entrance into the mortal realm. Often, the unschooled assumed that spirits would have the greater power and be able to move aside the veils themselves. Isbet never concerned the speaker, never corrected the speaker when, the, when she heard such things. The spirit of the old woman touched the remains, not in a physical sense, but with the intangible presence that gave life to the beings walking around the mortal realm. It had many names, sentia, quintessence, or soul. There was a violent jerk of the body and the she scream quieted. The eye sockets of the, of the eyeless sockets of the skull glowed with cold white light. The jar hung ajar. Okay. Well, that was it. I hope you all enjoyed, uh, my reading of tinderbox and i would love it oh thank you so much i appreciate that and i would love it if you'd give it a try like i said first in the uh, tales of the ribbons isles with taromancer being the second book and thank Perfect. you so much i i had to i had to stop you on a cliffhanger so everybody wants to buy the book now that was my, <laughs> was my plot there that's Wasn't. okay <laughs> <laughs> all right our second reader is nicole wilson 
Nicole Wilson's debut novel, Tide Pool, was a finalist for the Bram Stoker Award. Her novella, The Shadow Dancers of Brixton Hill, is out with Cemetery Gates Media, and her YA horror novel, The Keeper of the Key, will be coming out in November 2024. Nicole, over to you. Okay, thank you for coming. Um, just to set the scene for the Shadow Dancers of Brixton Hill a little bit, it's 1937 and Kate is scouting an act for her family circus, which has been struggling in the wake of the Great Depression. And this act does something so unique and so shocking that their trainer, whose name is Louis Oswald, won't tell Kate what they do. He wants her to see the act for herself. And in this excerpt, she does. Oswald had built a small red brick theater on his property for auditions and for the exhibitions he sometimes held to showcase his students. The yellowed marquee over the front entrance read coming soon in large black letters, but listed no attractions. The wooden floor inside the theater was scuffed and dull. Faint odors of mildew and cigarette smoke hung in the air. Several rows of red plush seats led down to a stage empty, but for an upright piano at stage left, and three square black cushions lined up side by side on the floor, facing a large white screen. A bright stage light hung overhead. The sounds of people walking around and murmuring carried from backstage. The floor creaked under my feet, and Oswald emerged from the backstage area almost at once. He now wore a violet velvet ringmaster jacket with gold buttons that strained a bit over his midsection, black breeches, and knee-high black leather boots. In contrast to his graying mustache and goatee, his, slick, his slicked back hair was still quite black. Ah, Kate, right on time, excellent. He walked to center stage and gestured to the empty rows. Please sit anywhere. I chose a seat in the center of a middle row. Oswald positioned himself under the stage light, took a deep breath and threw his arms wide. When he spoke again, his voice boomed as if he were addressing a sold out house full of roaring patrons. We're so honored that you traveled all this way to see my newest stars, Miss Montgomery. You will be very glad you did. What you are about to watch has never been seen anywhere in the world. I developed the idea from Egyptian mystics I met several years ago, and it took many, many years of hard work and heartbreak to, perf to perfect this astonishing act. Before we begin, please take note. You, I, and the performers are the only ones in this theater. And the sole sources of light are here and here. He pointed at the ceiling and then the footlights. My assistant, Mrs. Mildred Morrigan, will be accompanying my performers on the piano this afternoon. Mrs. Morrigan? A tall older woman with a helmet of black hair and Marcel waves emerged from backstage. She smoothed her hands over a dress the color of cooked liver and took a seat at the piano. She opened the sheet music on the stand and cleared her throat. <clears> throat> And now it is my pleasure to introduce Abigail, Camilla and Rose, the shadow dancers. Oswald hurried backstage. The lights in the theater dimmed, but the footlights remained bright. Three young girls emerged from backstage in a single file line. Their hair was pulled back in severe braided buns and they wore matching white tutus with pink tights and slippers. They put me in mind of the young ballerinas in a Degas painting. At first glance, they appeared completely identical. But as they positioned themselves in front of the cushions, I noticed differences in hair color and height. Each of them turned away from me and sat down cross-legged on a cushion. Now I was looking at their ruler straight backs and the stark black shadows their bodies cast on the white screen. Mrs. Morrigan launched into a piece I recognized from years of music lessons as Mozart's Turkish March. She played the piece accurately, but with little speed and no finesse. The girls remained seated on the floor. But then their shadows stood, towering over them on the blank white screen. My breath caught in my throat. I turned to look for any possible source of this bizarre illusion, but the theater behind me was completely empty. And then the shadows began to dance. They linked their black arms together and moved in complete unison back and forth. Their elongated legs crossed and uncrossed, and their heads turned to the music with smooth, crisp perfection even as their owners remained still as marble on the cushions. My pulse raced and I took a deep breath. Remarkable, isn't it? So engrossed was I in this bizarre performance, I hadn't noticed Oswald approach in the darkness and I jumped. It is. I spoke to him, but couldn't take my eyes off the improbable sight of on stage. How on earth are you doing this? I am doing nothing, Kate. He sat down next to me. 
these amazing young ladies are able to manipulate their shadows all by themselves. <laughs> but that's not possible. He let out a deep chuckle and patted my arm. You are quite welcome to explore every nook and cranny of this theater, if you doubt me. Should you find any proof of stagecraft, I will compensate you for your time and effort traveling here and send you on your way with my deepest apologies. Feel free to take the stage to watch some more closely. You will not distract my girls. Nothing can when they are performing. Mrs. Morrigan launched into Mozart's Symphony No. 40 in G minor, and the shadows twirled and leaped around the screen, their black arms and legs moving in an elegant and precise fashion to the music. I rose from my seat and stared at the ceiling, but if there was a stagehand lurking somewhere in those cobweb rafters and projecting dancing shadows onto that screen, I could not find him. Moving with caution in the dim theater, I walked up front and stepped onto the stage, edging around the dancers until I could see their faces. And a chill spread through my stomach. The three girls, little more than children, stared at the wall like pale, dead-eyed dolls, lifeless and empty, their lips parted and slack. They did not blink. They did not glance sideways to acknowledge my presence. They were so still that for a moment I was unsure they were actually alive. Their eerie appearance reminded me of the time father had taken me to a fancy toy store for a childhood birthday. He thought I would be delighted by the wide variety of dolls available for sale. Instead, the rows of lifeless little bodies with their glassy blank eyes, frozen faces, and gaping mouths disturbed me so much I cried and begged to be taken home. These shadow dancers looked uncannily like those dolls. I studied the girl nearest me until at last I detected the faint rise and fall of her chest. And then something else made me clutch a curtain in shock. Their dancing shadows were fully detached from their bodies. I scanned the theater behind them. Oswald sat where I had left him, exhaling great clouds of cigarette smoke and watching my bemusement with a smirk. Again, there were no signs of concealed projectors or anything else that could make sense of this display. How could this be happening? I glanced between the stone still girls and their kinetic shadows, but no obvious answer appeared. I rapped on the screen where the shadows danced. It felt sturdy under my knuckles. Defeated, I left the stage area and returned to Oswald, who grinned so widely I thought his face might crack in half. Satisfied, Miss Montgomery? I took my seat. I can't figure out how you're doing this, but it is indeed an impressive illusion. As I have already told you, it is no illusion, my dear. Mrs. Morrigan reached the end of the Mozart piece and stopped. With that, the shadows retreated at once to their owner's bodies. And that's it. And if you enjoyed this, please enter my giveaway for a signed copy of this novella. And thanks again for coming. This is the problem. Like I said earlier, you come in with a relatively normal sized TBR and it just gets <laughs> so much bigger. It was creepy and atmospheric and ooh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Our third reader tonight is Marie Bellodeau. <laughs> Marie Bellodeau is an Ottawa-based author and storyteller. Her speculative fiction has won several awards and has been translated into French and Chinese, and the Chinese translation is at SF World. Marie is also a storyteller and has told stories across Canada in theaters, tea shops, at festivals and under disco balls. Marie, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. And I love the sound of your voice, Kate, you were saying at first. So, um, Thanks, girl. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. So uh, tonight I'll be reading from my latest book. But first, I want you to step back with me for just a minute back into the past when I first got published in 2008. It was my first uh, trilogy epic fantasy, The Heirs of a Broken Land. And I took them back out after getting the rights back from my publisher just a few years ago. And it's these pretty books. Ta-da! And when I reread them and re-edited them, I, I thought to myself, I've always had a fourth book that I wanted to read, to write in this series and read. And instead of just a book, it suddenly turned into a trilogy. And instead of doing it right after the end of the final battle, that climactic moment, I thought, it's been almost 20 years. I'm older. I'm at least 15 years older, middle-aged now. And the three women main characters are now, well, 
why don't I make them older too so that we skip 20 years from the final battle and then we get into book one of Keepers of a Broken Line, Oathbreaker, which you can start with this book. You don't need to read the first trilogy first. You can start in this trilogy instead because I'm just very clever like that. So these are three middle-aged heroines who have won the day 20 years ago and now are trying to figure out if hmm things are going bad again, bad enough for an entire trilogy. So this is chapter one. Avariel Greyloff tried hard to ignore the dockmaster beside her as she analyzed the deep claw marks in the wood. Her fingers caught in the three large scratches in what had once belonged to a ship's hull. Before she turned her attention to the metal wrapped around splintered wood, the wet ripped fabric, and the other few telltale signs of what had happened to the large fishing vessel. It had been 20 years since she'd seen something like this. 20 years had not been long enough. What do you think? The gruff man beside her asked, arms folded. Avariel ignored him, focusing on the wreck, the third of these in so many months. Same deal, isn't it? He asked, followed by a grunt. Avariel turned to face Lono Haller, dock master of Raklar. She didn't like him and fought her instincts to scowl at him. He'd made it hard for her to get her fair share of fish, the woman from Graydon. If her son hadn't been a descendant of Elihor and his father's grandfather hadn't stood up for her, she'd have had to fight for food. She fought the urge to just hit him and be done with it, the proximity of a monster making her alert and itching for a fight. He raised an eyebrow, slowly waiting for an answer. She wanted to punch that eyebrow specifically and make sure it never rose again. With any luck, he'd slip and fall in the water, and the monster would chew on him. The thought brought a smile to her face as she focused on him. With her full attention on him, not to mention her grin, he shrank back as she towered over him. His fully black eyes still managed to meet her hazel ones, to his credit. It's the third one, he hissed, panic and anger bubbling out of him. Avariel knew that anger, and how it led to rash decisions. She'd seen it happen often enough in her lifetime. She sighed and forced herself to place a hand on his shoulder, urging him to focus back on her. To stop fishing would mean less food, something they could not afford. For now, keep your boats closer to shore, Doc Master Haller. She invoked his title like a soothing spell, squeezing his shoulder to ground him. Predictably, he bought it, perked up, looked proud. A beat passed before he nodded. His glance shifted sideways toward Rojan, her son, who had decided to stay at the edge of the docks. Her hand dropped from his shoulder, annoyed. She was proud of her son and what he'd chosen to become, but she was irritated that the dockmaster turned to him when she was the one with battle experience. He's a descendant of Elihor, they trust him, and that's good for you, stubborn woman. Besides, there was a reason her son hadn't followed her here. She hesitated, then pushed forward. Survivors? The dockmaster shook his head and his, her shoulders dropped. Anger bubbled deep inside her, and she squashed it down as far as she could, knowing there were no monsters for her to punch just yet. And she needed to tend to her son first. As she walked to join him, she was careful not to crush the moss spreading between the walkway stones. It'll be fine if you step on it, Mom. Rojan waited for her at the end of the dwarf, his large collection bag already filled with seeds and pods from the plants growing along the shores, hands covered in dirt, as usual. Her grandfather sat on a bench carved from stone, cane held in hand, sharp eyes studying her. In the west, he would call Rojan's, he would be called Rojan's great-grandfather, but in Elihor, everything above a parent was just a grandparent. The people of Greydon like to complicate things. Kel had one joke to her. Well, things were complicated now, though she wished they weren't. She forced her worries down and kissed her son on the cheek. Her son was as tall as she was, just sigh of twenty, completely dark eyes looked back at her, like his father's. The breeze ruffled his hair, red like hers. He stood out in Elihor and would stand out in Graydon too. She guided him to the bench and sat him between her and the old man. Kale's hand went to Rojan's back 
as though understanding some bad news would be delivered to his grandson. The weight of what she had to do pressed on her again, the anger seething just beneath it. Rojan. She took his hands in hers, calloused from gardening tools instead of sword play, unlike hers. Her son had grown up in a world recuperating from unimaginable loss, the path to healing riddled with plague and hardship, but he'd never known direct conflict and loss. She took a deep, shaking breath. Best he heard it from her. I'm sorry, Rojan. Torbalam was part of the crew. Did he make it? Rojan choked the words out. She cupped his she cheek and he folded into her. She held him as grief poured out of him. Kel's eyes caught hers, their darkness matching her son's, but their intensity matching her own. Why do these attacks keep happening? Rojan asked once he'd caught his breath. The winds shifted, the scent of meats and spices calling to them. It neared supper time, villagers gathering in the pubs to support each other and find comfort in numbers. They might not know that monsters had attacked the boats, but they certainly knew something was wrong, and they were losing friends. The village felt as though it collectively held its breath, waiting for the next blow, its citizens keenly familiar with the dread of waiting, the helplessness of it. I don't know. Avariel said, looking toward the still-growing forest to the south, where nested her home. Who would do this? Avariel was equally unsure about that. She wanted to keep her son in the dark, for him to keep his innocence and gentle love of plants and architecture. A war waged within her. The mother, wanting to protect her son. The warrior, knowing protection came from being prepared. And the veteran of the days of blood, who'd always known this day would come, yet had hoped it wouldn't. The past, at times, seemed impossibly far. At other times, it breathed down her neck. And we will stop here. Thank you all. And if you like uh, Oathbreaker, I'm finished. Magic Breaker Part 2 and Empire Breaker Part 3 already. So uh, you can get a free copy of Oathbreaker if you want to find out uh, what else happens in it. And thank you for the lovely comments. The end of that, all of that emotion, it just <gasps> got me. You got me, girl. Yes. Punch <laughs> in the heart. <laughs> you started with a punch in the eyebrow. You ended with a punch in the heart. Getting it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our fourth reader today is Arlene F. Marks. Multi-genre author and compulsive teacher, Arlene F. Marks, has been part of the writing and publishing world for 50 years and is loving it, especially if she gets to build worlds and birth characters. Her recent published sci-fi fantasy includes a short includes a story collection and 10 genre-bending novels, all well received, and there's plenty more to come. Arlene, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, so I'm uh, going to uh, read you an excerpt from The Bloodstone, which is the second book of the Nash Terrell series. Uh, it, uh, it's enjoyable as a standalone. Um, and my giveaway is going to be the first book in the series. Signed by the author. Uh, just a bit of, of background here. The Nash Terrell are, uh, is a race of shape-shifting, essence-drinking alien vampires who have fled to Earth. They're hiding out from a genocide on their homeworld. And they have blended in. They're, they've been with us for 1,500 years. Uh, Travis is the half Nash Terrell teen. He's got a human mother. Uh, he's 15 years old uh, and into hockey. Uh, his, his parents are Ken and Angie. Uh, Ken is full, a full-blooded Nash Terrell. His godparents are also Nash Terrell, Baron and Vicky. They live on the West Coast. Uh, his grandparents are Nash Terrell, and that's Maury and Gershred, Shred for short. Um, tra uh, Travis was 
fully human until about the age of 15. And now his alien side has come out and it's no longer safe for him to be living in Ontario. So he is being shipped west to, to Vancouver to be picked up by his parents and taken to a Nashtarel community in northern British Columbia. Vicky has decided to host everyone who's in Vancouver for a dinner party before Travis arrives. And Vicky and Angie are not getting along very well. Ken and Angie arrived at the door of Vicky and Barron's apartment right on time for dinner. Angie had baked a hostess gift of cookies, something sweet, she explained as she handed them to Vicky to symbolize a long-awaited family reunion. And of course, she added, they'd also been Travis's favorite kind when he was much younger. Both the gift and the gesture were very human, Shred mused. A hostess gift generally signified gratitude and appreciation. Unfortunately, the body language that accompanied this offering was giving it a whole other meaning. Angie's lips were curved in a polite pro forma smile, but her back was as rigid as a rifle-mounted bayonet. Vicky's spine, as she accepted the plastic container, was just as straight, and her expression just as strained. Evidently, she saw this gift for what it was, a reminder of whom she was dealing with and a warning not to insert herself between the human mother and her offspring. Oh, you shouldn't have, Vicky purred. There were two ways to interpret her words. Neither one put Shred at ease. Baron stepped over, ostensibly to help Ken and Angie hang up their coats, but mainly, Shred suspected, to break the tension of the moment. Baron had clearly understated the animosity between Travis's mother and godmother earlier. No matter how little time passed on the clock, it was bound to be a long and stressful evening. The dining room table had been set for five. Since everyone was now present, Vicky invited her guests to take their seats, then headed for the kitchen with the cookies. Shred remained on his feet, meanwhile, to greet Ken and Angie in person before the main event began. Tall and curvy and still practically oozing essence from her pores, Angie appeared not to have aged a minute since the first time Shred had laid eyes on her. Only her hairdo had changed, the dark ponytail giving way to a much shorter style. Like Vicky's, her smile was a little too bright for the occasion, he noted, but there was steel in her expression as well. She was on a mission to reclaim her child and if that meant making nice with the vampire godmother for a few hours, then that was what she would do. Knowing how Travis already felt about his parents, Shred amended his earlier thought. It was going to be a long and exhausting evening. Ken strode over to stand beside his mate. His posture was protective, and he was clearly on alert, his narrowed gaze sweeping the room. Ken was assessing the threat level. That was good. It was one of the skills he had come out here to learn. And yet there was something disquieting about the way shades seemed to come down over the light in Angie's brown eyes each time she looked at him. The tension between them was like a static charge in the air. Shred made a mental note to take Angie aside later. Whatever was going on, Ken would probably not want to talk about it. He was becoming a warrior, and warriors were stoical. It's good to see you again, Gershrit, said Angie. She walked over and gave him a brief hug, then stepped aside as Ken came forward to greet him too. Are you two all right? Shred asked in a hushed voice. We're fine, Ken replied, just being careful. Without moving his head, he cast a sideways glance at the kitchen door. Meanwhile, Angie stood with her lips pressed together as though to hold back a different response. When she did speak, it was ask, It was to ask, how is Travis? Is he looking forward to joining us? The short answer was no, he wasn't. But Shred wasn't about to tell them that. He led the way to the dining table and waited until everyone was seated before replying, 
Travis is 15 human years old. He's the star forward on a U16 hockey team that just medaled in a regional tournament. And for now, he's both loving and hating being half Nash Durrell. For now, Ken echoed, frowning. Meaning until he gets here and decides how he really feels about it? He's not keen on moving west, is he? Angie said with a sigh. He'd rather stay in familiar surroundings. Yes, but we couldn't give him that choice, Shred replied, not after he began shape-shifting on the ice in front of all those spectators. Just then, Vicky emerged from the kitchen carrying a plank heaped with Ken's favorite dish, steak tartare. She set it down in the middle of the table, then added a large basket of gourmet breads and fancy crackers. A huge wooden bowl of Caesar salad took up most of the remaining space. Finally, looking like something that had gotten lost on its way to an entirely different meal, a bread and butter dish full of cold cuts appeared next to Angie's place setting. This had to be Vicky's response to the cookies. The three male Nash Durrell watched to see what Angie's reaction would be. Smiling with a warmth that didn't reach her eyes, she said, Thank you, Victoria. Then she picked up her spoon, plucked half a roll from the bread basket, and scooped some of the steak tartare onto it before putting it deliberately onto her plate. All eyes now turned to Vicky, who had also chosen to smile. I thought you would prefer cooked meat. And I appreciate the thought. But Ken introduced me to tartare years ago, and I rather like it. So unless you only made enough for four? Everyone in the room heard that gauntlet hit the floor. As Shred and Baron exchanged concerned looks, Vicky drew herself up and refreshed her expression. You ought to know by now that I always make more than enough, my dear. By all means, help yourself. Ah, uh, Arlene! I know. I'm sorry. I have to cut you off here. Okay. The rest of this dinner party is going to have to remain <laughs> to be determined. You're going to have to read Bloodstone to find out. Will they eat the tartare? Will they eat the cookies? What comes next? But thank you for reading with us, Eileen. Sorry to cut you off, girl. I was almost finished. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Our fifth reader tonight is Mariska Pichette. Mariska Pichette is a queer author based in Massachusetts. Her work has appeared in Strange Horizons, Clark's World, F and SF, and others. She has been nominated for the Best of the Net, Pushcart, Utopia, and Dwarf Stars Awards. Her poetry collections, Rivers in Your Skin, Sirens in Your Hair, is out now from Android Press. Mariska, take it away. Thank you. Um, so this collection is divided in two. The first half is more folky nature inspired poetry. The second half is a little darker, some more horror poetry. So I'm going to read a couple poems from each half, but with the uniting theme of fairy tale uh, retellings. So I'll just dive in. What roots she has her own. In the forgotten tower, she reads a library. Forgotten worlds in forgotten pages like and nothing like her own. Her forgotten room is small. Lined with shelves, she reads 1200 worlds together, holding her place with endless strands of wheat gold hair. Sitting in her web of forgetting, she tugs, ties, Binds her forgotten present to a thousand futures, unbraiding. Now we've got another Rapunzel one. <laughs> they grow between foundation stones. Rapunzel's hair was hyphy. She lay down in moss and topsoil, garter snakes circling her lips, tasting futures on the air. Her hair grew and grew, meeting sycamore roots and birch, tracing footprints of ages and fossils forgotten. In the shade of a medieval folly, Rapunzel decided to wait no more. She buried herself in leaf litter and wove her face a fungal sleeping mask. 
ages after, princes came looking for the maiden Gothel forgot. But where a tower once stood, they found a fairy ring. Pale mushrooms rising, kissing light instead of lips, sending their spores at last to the ends of the world, carried on the boots of oblivious knights. All right, now we're going to go a little darker. Heel to toe. My grandmother put silver slippers on my feet. She told me to walk in them, click my heels. Her slippers glittered like stars as I teetered from bed to wall, click, click, click. Back with her at bed's end, I stepped out and found blood lining, dried spots adorning the heel of one, toe of the other. I asked her how she cut her feet inside shoes that always, always fit her perfectly. She said nothing, said to put her lovely slippers on again. My feet grew to fit, cover the stains and click my way to work, click me home again. My grandmother died when I was 25, lying alone in that bed, gray hair a veil across her face. I found her amidst tangled quilts, unscarred feet bare, like mine used to be. The art of betraying others for food. First, one must be selective. Very few dishes can be valued above the lives of your loved ones or the world. Case, items labeled for consumption. Arranged on a glass end table, they plead. Drink me, eat me, honor this request. Pick your potion, select your quantity, destroy private property in anticipation of another bite. Case, breadcrumbs. To rid oneself of meddlesome stepchildren, charge a dustbuster to its full potential. Follow the trail they made, cleaning all the way. These crumbs are perfect for stuffing. Case. Candy house. Set your oven to 400 degrees. Wrap your witch in aluminum to prevent dry meat. Roast, toast, and finish with candied walls. Case. A basket of goodies. Here is a crossroads. Your tongue lolls. For sweets, murder one girl. But if you are the girl... Case, wolf meat. Take one knife and sharpen it next to a cottage and an axe. Skin, mindful not to stain grandmother's best linens. Case, sons who rape. One meat pie, seasoned and served as an appetizer for blood. The aperitif is always delicious. The glaciers made her deep. When I was born, the valley whispered into my ear, these hills will hold you. These hills will keep you safe. I listened and I walked the paths she laid across her chest, following the murmur of the river at her heart. Each time I looked up from her soul, I saw them holding the horizon at bay. Trees formed a lattice to dapple the sun, at night, they played tricks with the moon. She sleeps on, swaddled in promises. Awake, I have seen what waits beyond the valley. I do not tell her, though it comes closer every year. I do not interrupt her dreaming pulse as the horizon leans over her hills, breathing ripples onto calm water. And the last poem I'll read is called, Wait When Ice Forms Over My Fingertips. Wait when ice forms over my fingertips like acrylic nails, biting through skin and overwhelming my eyes. My heart isn't strong, it never was. And I saw the Nove exploding across your face and I wanted their fire. I dreamt of stardust and murder, your lips like a coffin seal out the enemy of life and they stop and never stop, but I want to see them start 
Oh, just once, let me start. Let me talk when I know I can't. And I know my teeth are shifting and my gums bleed every night. But it's okay because you're permeable and we can feel together and you bleed beneath me and I scream yes, because we did it and it hurt. But scars tell us where we were and I was and you were too. I wear my scars with pride because getting this far, it hurts. Thank you. And there is a giveaway with a bookmark um, with the cover art from my collection and a letter. I am a big stationary buff, so I have lots and lots of stationary. I'd love to send that out to someone if you enter the giveaway. And thank you so much to everyone who came out today.